Hey guys, today's video lecture is going to be over two of our eukaryotic kingdoms, Kingdom Protista and Kingdom Fungi. I'm going to warn you now that it's a long one, it's a lot of information, so just bear with me. You only have a couple more of these throughout the year. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video. So we're going to start by doing a quick review of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells. This should not be new information, you should know this already. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, do not have membrane-bound organelles, are much simpler, are much smaller. The only type of prokaryotic organism is bacteria. Everything else has eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. They do have those fancy, fancy membrane-bound organelles, mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi body, endoplasmic reticulum, which makes them much more complex, meaning that they are much larger cells. So we are looking now at the domain eukarya. Remember there are three domains, two that belong to bacteria, and then the other has all of our eukaryotic organisms. So the domain eukarya has four kingdoms that fall under it. Kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, kingdom plantae, and kingdom animalia. We're looking at two of those kingdoms today, the protists and the fungi. So where so we're starting by looking at our very first eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic celled organisms. Where did the first eukaryotic cells come from? Well, obviously we can't know for sure, but we have an idea based on the evidence that is a eukaryotic cell. So the explanation that, that tells us where eukaryotic cells originated is called the endosymbiotic theory. Endo, we know, means into. Symbiotic is referring to some sort of symbiosis. So let's talk about how this happened. So we think, you know, millions of billions of years ago, there were prokaryotic organisms living. So bacteria. There were big prokaryotes. There were medium-sized prokaryotes. There were small prokaryotes. And we think that at one point, one of those larger prokaryotic cells got a little hungry and engulfed one of those smaller prokaryotic cells. And then they did something interesting. They started living symbiotically and growing and dividing as if they were one single organism. So we think that those smaller prokaryotes that got engulfed over millions of years became what we think of today as our modern organelles. And there's a lot of evidence that supports this, but the, one of the major pieces of evidence is that mitochondria and chloroplasts, for example, have their own DNA separate from the DNA that you would find in a nucleus. So those organelles must have been their own independent living organisms at one point in time. Okay, so we think the very first eukaryotic organisms are similar to what we now call protists. Um, so they are these, you know, very diverse kingdom. Um, there's only one unifying characteristic, and that is that they are all eukaryotic. Every protist is eukaryotic, but then there's a little bit of everything else. So some protists are unicellular, some are multicellular, some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic. Some reproduce asexually, some reproduce sexually. Some can reproduce both asexually and sexually. So we call this kingdom the junk drawer kingdom, and that's an appropriate nickname because just like your junk drawer at home, these organisms don't really fit anywhere else, so we sort of shove them into a kingdom altogether. There's a lot of conversation right now about whether or not they should be split up into further kingdoms because there are three major categories of protists based on how they obtain their nutrition. So the three categories of protists are animal-like protists, which are heterotrophic, just like animals are. There are plant-like protists, which are autotrophic. They make their own food, just like plants. And then there are fungus-like protists, which are saprotrophic, which means they're decomposers. <clears throat> okay, so these are the, the protists that we're going to really look at in detail. Amoeba, paramecium, euglena, and then the fungus-like protists, slime molds. So let's start by talking about our animal-like protists. Um, sometimes they're called protozoans, which has a Greek origin, pro meaning like pre or before, and then we know that zoology is the study of animals, so this actually means first animals. What makes them animal-like? The fact that they are animal-like um, has to do with the fact that they are heterotrophic, meaning they do not make their own food, they have to consume other organisms, and then they do not have a cell wall just like actual animals. So some examples of animal-like protists. Amoeba, paramecium, stentor, which is what this is a picture of here, and then plasmodium. So there are some different types of animal-like protists. One group of animal-like protists are called ciliates. This would be like the paramecium that we observed in class. They're interesting because they have cilia, these little hair-like projections all around the cell that they move and, and they sort of move the hairs and that's how the cell moves. And they also have two nuclei, a macronucleus and a micronucleus. And then you can see these star-like structures here. These are contractile vacuoles that a lot of protists have that help them remove excess water. Another group of animal-like protists are the sarcodines. Um, an example of a sarcodine is amoeba that you saw in class. 
And these guys move with pseudopods, which is, which is another name for false feet. And the way that they do this is they actually have two kinds of cytoplasm, an endoplasm, which is really soft inside, and an ectoplasm, which is a harder cytoplasm just inside the cell membrane. And they push that softer endoplasm out towards the ectoplasm, which makes the cell membrane stretch out, and they sort of crawl along with these little projections, these temporary projections that they're making, like feet. Um, but they're only temporary, so we call them false feet. Okay, then there are some uh, animal-like protists that can actually make you sick. You've probably heard of dysentery, which can be caused by an amoeba. You've probably heard of malaria, which is caused by a plasmodium that produces spores. And then you may or may not have heard of American sleeping sickness or African sleeping sickness that's caused by an animal-like protist that has a flagella. That's an interesting one you should look up. Then some vocab terms. So pause on this slide if you need to to get some of these protist structures written down, their definitions. I'm going to go ahead and keep on going, but make sure you get those definitions. You have to have all your notes in order to be able to use them for the homework check. Okay, the two animal-like protists that you are going to be responsible for knowing are the amoeba and the paramecium. So again, pause on this picture, get your drawings done, label the major parts that, that you're going to be expected to know. Okay, moving on from animal-like protists, we're going to talk about plant-like protists. Another name for plant-like protists is algae. You've heard that before. When you're talking about algae, you're not actually not talking about plants. You're talking about plant-like protists. So what makes them like plants? Well, they're autotrophic. They can make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. And as it turns out, plant-like protists actually make about 70% of our Earth's oxygen. Think about that for a second. Not trees, not grass, not actual plants, but protists. Algae make up 70% of our planet's oxygen. So plant-like protists are really diverse. Plant-like protists are really diverse, which actually makes them difficult to classify. There's phytoplankton, which we know are the producers that are at the base of a, of a marine food web. There are diatoms. There's dinoflagellates, which we learned about when we learned about algal blooms. There are, there's euglena. There's yellow-green algae. There's golden-brown algae. There's brown algae, also called kelp. There's green algae called volvox. These guys right here that live in sort of these weird colonies. There's red algae. So lots of different types of plant-like protists, which you can see here in this picture. Okay, the plant-like protist that you are going to be responsible for is the euglena. So take a minute to pause on this picture and get the major structures labeled. And then, like I said, there are lots of different uses for algae. Um, they're used in all sorts of different types of food. For example, your ice cream has a thickener in it called carrageenan that is actually made using a protist, using algae. That's used in sushi, right? That's the stuff they wrap around the outside. Um, their diatoms are used as abrasives, which is actually the abrasive stuff in your toothpaste. That's a protist called a diatom. Isn't that pretty weird to think about? So lots of uses for plant-like protists. We also talked about, when we talked about the phosphorus cycle, how when conditions are really good in water, it causes the algae to explode in number, which is great for the algae, but the problem with that is the algae then deplete the nutrients and the oxygen in the water, which causes the fish and the other marine organisms to suffocate and die. So we call that an algal bloom. When it is red algae that is having an algal bloom, um, you've probably heard it called the red tide before. All right, so moving on from plant-like protists, we're going to talk about fungus-like protists. So they're protists that are fungus-like. What makes them fungus-like? The fact that they are decomposers or they are saprotrophic, just like fungi are. And then they also use spores for reproduction, which, which true fungi also do. Now, interesting to point out, they have cell walls made of cellulose, unlike true fungi, which have cell walls made of chitin. So fungus-like protists include things called slime molds, which you may or may not have heard about, water molds, and then downy mildew, which if you've, if you've ever had fish, you have probably heard of. Um, they, just like fungus, they like to grow in damp, dark locations where there's some sort of decaying matter. And then, again, you have a wide variety of fungus-like protists. There's yellow slime mold, orange slime mold, blue, black, red slime mold, all sorts of different kinds. Okay, so that is the end of Kingdom Protista, so we are going to move on to Kingdom Fungi. So we just discussed fungus-like protists, now we are moving on to true fungi. So what makes a fungi a fungi? Why are they in a kingdom together? So of course fungi are eukaryotic because it's in domain eukaryotes, not bacteria. They are heterotrophic, they do not photosynthesize, they are not autotrophic. They get their food by decomposing dead and decaying material, so we call them saprotrophs. Um, they contain hyphae, which we'll talk about more in a second, and they have cell walls of a chemical compound called chitin. 
Most fungi are multicellular, but there actually is a group of fungi that are unicellular, that is yeast, which you've probably heard of before. Okay, some fungi structures that you are responsible for knowing. Um, they have cell walls made of chitin, which is the chemical compound that's actually the same that makes up the exoskeletons of arthropods, like insects. Uh, they have structures called hyphae, which are the thread-like filaments that make up the body of a fungus. And then that thread-like mass that's underground is called the mycelium. And it's actually the mycelium that is the main portion of the fungus. The part that you see and that you recognize, that's just a, the reproductive part of a fungus. The, the real body of the fungus is going to be underground and you're not really going to see it. So this picture illustrates that, okay? The part that you are used to seeing is called the fruiting body. That is only used for reproduction. So they only pop up when, when conditions are good for reproduction. The main portion of the fungus are, is this thread-like mass underground called mycelium. And then in that body, in that fruiting body, you have the, the hyphae filaments. So pause and label that picture on your notes organizer. Okay, so we know that fungi are heterotrophic. They do not photosynthesize. They do not make their own food. But do they ingest and then digest, or do they digest and then ingest? We obviously ingest, and then we digest. Fungi do the opposite. They send out digestive enzymes, and so outside of their body, they digest first, and then they ingest by absorbing those nutrients. There are three ways that fungi obtain nutrition. nutrition. There's saprophytic fungi, fun parasitic fungi, and mutualistic fungi. So saprophytic fungi are the ones that you're used to. They feed on dead organisms and decaying waste. Um, an example of that is the fairy ring mushroom. Um, they're called the fairy ring mushrooms because this type of mushroom, when a spore lands, it actually sends the hyphae and, or the mycelium underneath the ground in every direction. So it sort of grows in a circle. Um, and then when the, when the conditions are good, the fruiting bodies pop up, but because the mycelium has spread out in a circle, the mushrooms appear in a circle. And the, the old wives' tale used to say that wherever a fairy landed, that's where the mushrooms would go, so they thought fairies landed in the middle of these little circles of mushrooms. Parasitic fungi are fungi that absorb nutrients from cells that are still living. So one type of parasitic fungi that you're really familiar with is athlete's foot, which is a fungi that's taking nutrients from the cells in your skin. And then another is ringworm, not a worm, actually a fungus. And then mutualistic fungi, they are fungi that uh, get nutrition by living in a close symbiotic relationship with another organism where both are benefiting. An example of this are the, is the mycorrhizae covering the roots of a soybean plant, which we'll talk more about in a second. Okay, some reproduction vocabulary for fungi. Types of asexual reproduction in fungi. You have budding, which is happening in your unicellular fungi like yeast, where you actually have a new cell pinching off from the original parent cell. And then you can also have fragmentation, which is going to be your types of fungus that have mycelium, where the mycelium is literally physically broken apart, lands somewhere, and then begins to grow as its own separate organism. So we still only have one original you know, parent cell or piece, so the new fungus that grows from that is going to be genetically identical to the original fungus. Now, fungi have an interesting adaptation called spores. Spores are used in both the asexual and sexual life cycles of most fungi. In the asexual, in the asexual portion of a spore, you have a spore that was produced um, by one parent and it can actually grow without fertilization. In sexual reproduction using spores, they are produced, they are haploid through meiosis, just like we learned about last semester, but they have to be fertilized in order for the new fungus to grow. So obviously, two parents, the new fungus is going to be genetically different from the original parent fungus. Now, they're an interesting adaptation because they allow a fungus to survive and reproduce really easily. And, and why is that? Why are they able to do that? Because they produce tons of spores. So by producing tons of spores, they're ensuring that they're going to survive, you know, through by one. Uh, they're very small. They're very lightweight, which makes them easily picked up by wind, which means they can be spread really far. And they're actually protected by a tough, waterproof cell wall. So they're good for protection. There are four major phyla of fungi. There are the chytrids, which we think are the you know, most ancient, very first type of fungi that ever existed. There are the common molds, the zygomycotes. There are the sac fungi, or ascomycotes, that includes yeast. And then there are the ones you're most familiar with, the club fungi, that belong to the basidiomycota group. So that's, we're going to talk just for a second about phylum basidiomycota. Um, the basidiocarp is the fruiting body that some of you like to even eat. 
and they reproduce sexually using the spores that are produced by the basidia or the gills that are underneath the cap of the mushroom. And we're going to dissect a mushroom and you're going to get to see all of this. <clears throat> okay, so some examples of symbiotic relationships with fungi. There's lichens and mycorrhizae. I've got a little joke here. What did the fungus say to the algae? If you can look up the... Um, the joke there, what the answer is, the punchline to that joke, and write it down, I'll give you a bonus point. What did the fungus say to the algae? So lichens are actually not their own organism. It's two organisms living symbiotically together, a fungus and an algae. Mycorrhizae is an example of a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and some sort of plant's root system. So lichens, I said, are fungi and algae growing together. It's mutualistic, so they're both getting something. The, uh, the fungi are getting a place for the al they're giving a place for the algae to grow, and the algae, because they're plant-like protists, are photosynthesizing and making sugar, which is going to be then given to the fungi. So these are very resilient organisms, meaning they can grow very easily almost anywhere. So they're really good bioindicators. They indicate how healthy an environment is. If lichens are growing well, then you know that the environment is really healthy. If lichens can't even grow somewhere, then you know that the environment is not doing so hot. Another example is mycorrhizae, which is where you have a fungus that has like wrapped around and covered the roots of a certain type of plant. Now both are going to benefit from this. The um, fungus is going to get minerals, for, or sorry, sugars from the plant that is photosynthesizing. And then the plant is actually getting its roots surface area increased by the fungi, so it's getting more and more nutrients that it can take in. So you can see in this picture here, here's some plants growing that don't have the mycorrhizae wrapped around them, and here's plants that do. And you can see that the plants that are growing with this relationship um, are much healthier and more vigorous, you know, lusher looking plants. Here are some benefits of fungi. Some, uh, they're obviously nature's recyclers. They can clean an environment. They're used in different types of medicines. One medicine that you're probably familiar with is penicillin, which is actually a medicine made using a fungus. And then, of course, many people, myself not included, enjoy fungi in their foods, uh, like mushrooms. But, you know, there are some fungi that I do find useful, like yeast, um, the fungi that produce cheese. So there's fungi produced, or fungi used to produce alcohol. So many benefits of fungi. And then some harmful fungi. You've probably seen this before, where a fungal spore will land on an insect and then grow inside of it. Obviously, that's not good for whatever insect it lands on. Um, you know the, I don't know if you've ever heard of the chestnut tree blight that was caused by fungus, so they can destroy plants and crops. And then we've talked a little bit about athlete's foot, ringworm, thrush, yeast infections, those are all caused by fungi. So I know this one was longer, but make sure you have all of the answers to your notes organizer filled out so that you can use it for the homework check. Have a great day.